Welcome back. This is chapter six from the e-novel, survival novel. The walls came tumbling down. Fishing. The skin on the back of his neck crawled as he pedaled slowly along the road. Glancing constantly behind, he couldn't see anyone. Rather, he sensed someone was there. Tom had learned years ago to follow his gut on such things. Gut instinct was a straight term that simply meant your subconscious. Receptors were picking up something, but your conscience was not catching it for whatever reason. He was so tired now, weary to the bone, that he had gotten sloppy, made mistakes. It was hard to sleep during the day, for one thing. Riding at night and sleeping all day was not without hazards, he knew. While the back roads were paved and he could ride on them at a fair pace, he sometimes wondered if he would be riding up into something. Thus, he had been forced to make frequent stops, scanning ahead with his 7 by 50 binos. Many people did not know why the military chose the 7 by 50 and not more powerful binoculars. Tom remembered when they used to be called low-light binos. He had long forgotten all the tech data and jargon, but essentially the front objective lens of 50 divided by the rear magnification of 7 equaled the size of a fully darkened human pupil. This put the maximum amount of ambient light magnified on the human eye and acted as a poor man's image intensifier. Nowhere near as good as a starlight scope, of course, something he wished he had right about now. He had heard the marauders, knowing they were out in the daylight, scrounging, foraging, and hunting. Despite his efforts at remaining hidden, in retrospect, he knew he had gotten a little sloppy. The last couple of nights, he had simply flopped down a little too near the road and wasn't as careful as he should have been. An hour before dawn, in the quiet and lonely still of the night, Tom dismounted the bike and turned abruptly left off the one-lane asphalt road, heading straight toward the tree line at a 90-degree angle to the road. Moving uphill, the wet pasture grass would leave a very visible trail. Fifty feet into the tree line, he turned hard left, paralleling the road. Now he was headed back in the direction he had come. He moved about a hundred yards until he found a good position. From here he could observe his back trail to see who was following, who was making his skin crawl. It was a trick he and Al had learned in the Lerps years ago, something called a fish hook. The waning moon was very faint, but provided a bit of light as he lay the bike down behind some brush, stashing his ruck alongside. Satisfied, he pulled the charging handle back just a little on his M4 until he saw brass, and then did the same on his pistol. Tom quickly selected two places that would make good spots. Both had cover and concealment behind fairly large tree trunks. He would shoot from the right side of the tree because he was right-handed and most of his opponents would be too. Righties tended to pull to the right a little, especially under pressure, and this would put their shot hopefully into the tree and not into him. So he hoped. If he engaged, he would make one shot from this position, perhaps two, and then move back to a little one over to the right. After this, he didn't have much of a plan. He hoped it would be a small enough party. They would have a little cover, from the ditch. Once they got in the ditch, they would have to cross over the road to get him, exposing themselves in the process. Although he would have the advantage of surprise and shooting from behind pre-selected positions, they would most likely outnumber him. If they didn't stay bunched up in the ditch, if there weren't too many of them, if they didn't manage to flank him, he could win, but it would depend on how many there were and what they were armed with. Settling into a good prone position, he next moved some sticks and twigs aside so he would not make a telltale crack at the wrong time. He assumed a natural point of aim on the general direction of the place he had left the road. Satisfied, he moved back to his rucksack and got out of the side pouch a little four by four foot square of mesh netting, sometimes called a sniper veil. It was actually just an old school mesh laundry bag, OD in color. He filled it with some leaves and pine needles from the forest floor. Moving back to his position, he lay down 
draped the net carefully over himself and behind the rifle scope, with the leaves and needles falling off somewhat, laying over his head. It was hasty, he knew, but would work until somebody got a scope on him, at least. Now he would watch and wait. He scanned the road carefully through the scope. The ribbon of road was easily visible to the eye, and also through his scope. Anyone moving along the road would be contrasted against the pasture on the far side. And there was only a small scattering of brush along the road on the side where bird droppings had seeded the fence line. The ditch before the fence line would be the most likely cover someone would use. He did not anticipate anyone would come until after dawn, but he had to stop making assumptions had to start working the problem. In the scope, he could faintly see his exit trail. It would mostly disappear within a couple hours as the sun burned the dew away. After that, the matted grass would still be an obvious sign to a good tracker. His luck needed to change. Maybe today it would, maybe for the better. Tower. Little swirls of snow whipped around her parka, tickling her face gently. It was taking Linda much longer than she had anticipated to reach the town. The deep snows, the bitter cold, and above all, having to move so carefully to avoid being detected. All this had slowed her down by half again. Her food was running low, but fortunately it was all high-quality rations. Mark was always so thorough in his research. No lifeboat rations or cookies. Mark had carefully selected good, compact, lightweight food that was high in good carbs and real energy. Yesterday, for lunch, she had eaten a hot, freeze-dried ration, chicken and rice. It was quite good, and she wished it was more. Navigating mostly by terrain association, she followed a series of low valleys, staying always in the trees, always on the alert, watching, listening, stopping and smelling often. Several times she heard things that reinforced her need for caution. Once she heard snowmobiles and nearly panicked. Were they coming for her again? Had they seen her? Mostly, though, she fought back the fear that comes from being alone. Not the fear of being alone for a little while in the woods or alone in a room, but the fear that you were all alone in the world. Before Mark, she had been like that, her father and mother having been killed in an auto accident years earlier. Mark had changed all that, though. She pushed the thought from her mind. No time for that now, no time for tears. Still, though, the tears came, streaming down her face. She wept silently and fearfully. She had to move. She would be out of food soon, and the cold would slowly overcome her, wear her energy out until she died of hypothermia. She liked, she hiked the pack up and increased her pace just a little. It had been snowing off and on, but now it began to clear. The sun streamed through the clouds, reflecting off the snow. The brightness seemed to cheer her soul a bit, to give her some new hope. While she headed north again, she was startled to see how clear it had become. In the distance ahead, she saw a good range of hills, and she scoped them with her binos. The town would be on the other side of these hills, and it appeared on the map to be sparsely populated, but that map was quite old, she had to remember. Things could change, and usually more people would be present, not fewer. Carefully now, she scanned out a route with her binoculars. She would move up to the hills and stay just on this side of them tonight, on the south, and out of the prevailing winds, under cover in the trees. She did not want to be moving through a populated area at night, especially if she hadn't had time to look things over in the light. Tomorrow morning she would do just that, and maybe, just maybe, she would find him. His antenna would have to be high up, she reasoned. Maybe on a hilltop or high place, maybe on a tower. She remembered a Bible verse from her Sunday school, something about the Lord being a refuge, a high tower. She smiled a little and thought of the man, how he was sort of her high tower right now, too. Tracks. A horseshoe on pavement, 
makes a distinctive sound, especially to people who have ridden before. That sound now alerted Tom that something he had not considered. They were on horseback. Soon vague forms appeared in the pre-dawn mist. Four riders, armed, in the rear, two pack horses. They were now riding in the ditch, probably crossed over just recently. Had they not done so, Tom might not have been alerted, for they had remained silent. Were they disciplined ex-soldiers or merely tired? He would find out soon enough. If they were an advanced party, part of a larger element, he would have to let them go. He suddenly realized that, by leaving the trail deliberately, he had left out that option for himself. Silently, under his breath, he cursed himself for being so aggressive. The fishhook technique didn't require leaving a sign. It was something he had come up with on the spur of the moment. Sleep deprivation was affecting his thinking. Additionally, he didn't have a LERP team with him right now. He didn't have Claymore Mines and three other rangers. Worse still, he had no idea what kind of talent he was actually up against. If they were part of a bigger party, someone would probably have a radio. Upon finding his trail, they would react, and someone would call on the radio what they had found. If there was another element of this size he would definitely lose. Even now, this small, lightly armed team stood a good chance of beating him. Plus, there was always the possibility of bad luck, something he was intimately familiar with by now. Even a man with a piece of junk rifle can get a lucky shot in. These men were better armed than that, though, and probably better trained. Hands shaking a bit at the anticipation of trouble and combat, Tom scoped them slowly as their horses ambled by. He wished now he hadn't left that deliberate sign. From the look of the horses, they had been riding for a little while, probably since three or four this morning, but not much earlier. Horses looked too fresh otherwise. All four had western saddles. One man was wearing a white Stetson. Two had on billed caps. One had no hat at all. All were carrying rifles in their hands. The man with the Stetson resting an M4 on his hip, barrel in the air. By his demeanor, the way he pointed and spoke to the others, Tom identified him clearly as the leader. The men right behind the leader both had hunting rifles. One was carrying his across the saddle. The other cradling his in his arms and not in the scabbard. The man with no hat held a pump shotgun laying loosely across the saddle horn. The leader's head was on a swivel. He was scanning all around carefully. One of the riders was watching to the right across the open field, but the other two were simply looking down at their horses, apparently bored and daydreaming. This was a good sign. It meant these two at least had either no training or discipline or both good. The riders were wearing an eclectic assortment of gear. The leader had some sort of plate vest on. One had what looked like a pistol belt and holster. It was hard to see the gear on the other two. Pack men. horses were not neatly packed and there was a lot of odd gear tied on, although done fairly well. Somebody at least had run a pack horse a time or two before. These men were not a local patrol, not out riding fence though. Nobody took a pack mule on patrol. Also, the loads on the horses were far too large for men simply on patrol, too odd shaped to be something a traveler would pack, not deliberately. These weren't refugees either. If so, there would be women and children along. Rather, these men looked ready for a fight. They looked like predators. None of them glanced over his shoulder. They were hunters, not the hunted. Home Guard Ski slicing across the hard-packed snow, brisk air so cold it stole the breath from my lungs as I led the ten-man patrol. All were fairly good cross-country skiers. I think of the group, I was probably the least experienced. Being from Texas, though, I had an excuse, had an alibi, but I knew in life there are two choices in every situation. Find an excuse or find a way. This was our way, the town's way, and our solution to the problem of the raiders. When solving a problem, you take what you have and make it work. I was now grateful that Nordic skiing was such a popular support in this area. I only wish that military tactics and leadership were also, but we would make this work. What other choice did we have? 
The equinox of the sun in the sky was changing now. The sky seemed a bit larger, higher, more open. The forest would soon wake up and bring a sense of hope to us all. Today was the first patrol of the Swedish Guard, or Home Guard, a name chosen by the town council. The mayor and I had spoken offline about the need for a name that was not too provocative, but also described our purpose. We were to guard the locals, mostly Swedes. At the town hall meeting two nights ago, it was decided to establish a local home guard unit. I had spoken to the mayor and town council offline, and I said deliberately we should avoid using the word militia because it was so emotionally charged, even though that's precisely what this was. The unit would hold a training day in two weeks at the town baseball diamond area, a field with a chicken wire backstop where the kids all played, right behind the old schoolhouse, which was now serving as the town hall. If it were raining or snowing that day, we would simply meet inside the gymnasium. At the meeting, I was asked by the town council to take command of the unit because of my background. I said that I would instead serve as its instructor and that the members of the unit should be elected. They should elect their commander as well as their patrol leaders but that we should temporarily appoint people to these positions while we got organized and trained. That night we identified the men with prior military and asked them to come to my farm the following night. I explained to them that they would be temporarily in charge of their own patrols and we would run on a rotating schedule. Each patrol would have men of varying background and talent as well. They would receive their operations order at my farm that night I got my ranger handbook out and got very depressed and frustrated when I realized just how much we had to learn and teach. We would have to manage our expectations for sure. That night at my farm we had cornbread and coffee and then I issued them a brief operations order and explained that they would be going on a patrol that would be establishing one of the routes. That this was a train the trainer event to build our cadre and leaders. Some of them winced at the last word. They knew exactly what was required of a leader. These men would therefore make the best leaders because they knew it was no glorious task. It was just a lot of hard work. Secretly inside, I think we all were wishing we could just wind the hands of the clock back to a time when we would have been doing anything but what we are doing right now. For now, though, the leaders would be appointed. Later, they would be elected. Some did not like the idea of elections and said it would turn the leadership into a popularity contest, which is certainly a possibility. However, I had seen other units, including the British SAS, elect their team leaders, and it had worked. I believe, though, it worked for them because they knew better than to choose based upon anything but ability. It seems the closer you are to the tip of the spear, the more you seem to focus on important items. And we were definitely the tip of the spear now. We had miles to cover on skis today through woods filled with not just potential, but also proven dangers. We would be establishing patrol bases today, but also I would be making sure all the patrol leaders knew what they were about. Four of the men behind me had combat experience. That wasn't as many as I had hoped for, but in a town our size, that wasn't bad. The rest had served in the military, and two of the men had also been in law enforcement. One was a fishing game officer and the other state trooper. Our military background would certainly help. We would know how to plan and lead, or at least learn quickly, I hoped. Equally comforting to me was the knowledge that they all knew how to shoot, how to take orders, and how to do some first aid, or so I hoped in case I got shot again. As we slogged over an uphill stretch, I knew in reality that we would feel these patrols with great support and enthusiasm from the town for the first few weeks. Then the routine would wear many out and there would be a lot of shirking. We would cross that bridge when we came to it. For now though, we were training the patrol leaders. Looters. Tom began calculating how he would engage them. The man with the AR was clearly the leader. That would be Tom's first shot. Otherwise, he would make the men far more effective. His second target would be either man with a scope rifle that he could get the best shot on. He would then take the other scope rifle 
and save the shotgunner for last. He tried not to think of the word if in any of his plans right now. He had to keep things basic, positive, and simple. The men looked like they would ride past his trail, and he held his breath, hoping, pulse pounding in his head with the anticipation. With any luck, they would keep riding. He would not do this again. He would never leave sign for any reason, not on purpose. The clarion, the tiny printer whirred and labored, then after a pause, emitted a single sheet. Reaching into the tray, David grasped the still warm paper in his hands, inspecting it, holding it appreciatively at arm's length, squinting through his bifocals. Sarah would be so proud. He wished she was here, but then he realized she was always with him in his heart and in his memories. Printed front and back, the clarion was probably the first newspaper of its kind, at least since the collapse, and definitely the first one of this kind he had seen in his lifetime. David had done his best to record news that he thought would be important, significant, news that people would be willing to pay him for, not in money, but in food and needful things. Because he was trying to promote and sell the clarion, he put a lot of effort into the design. He wanted it to look like a newspaper, after all. It was organized with tiny headlines for each piece of news. He would stick to a certain format, too, the most sensational news on the top and the local news on the back. Perhaps he would include an obituary column one day. Above all, it had things people would want to know, that they needed to know. He knew others would have shortwave tuners, but they could not get one-tenth of the range he had. He would also need to get a lot of local news, announcements, maybe even weather. He would need to get out of the house now a lot more, though, and that was dangerous. Sarah had always chided him gently that there was life outside of his radio room. He smiled and thought about how right she was on that. He would take the paper to Al's house and see what they thought. The man had always seemed a bit odd, but harmless, always mentioning self-sufficiency and being prepared. Not obsessed, but definitely oriented in that direction. He wasn't a wild-eyed fanatic about it, though. He had met those types of people before, and they were not easy to be around. He might have some insight on how to get the paper published better. He hoped it would be a success. He could hear Sarah's voice telling him it was going to be. With a smile, he carefully folded the paper, put it in his shirt pocket, and got ready to make the walk down the hill.